Okay. So we left off last class talking about what is the most important thing when you're trying to figure out which carbon is going to carry charge. And we realized it was, you know, number one was atom. Then we got to worry about resonance. Resonance is really, really important, like super important, like the most important. Then we have this induction hyperconjugation dogfight between the two of them where depending on the extremity of one or the other, uh, one or the other can dominate. So what we've covered up to this point mechanistically are Markovnikov reactions, which are essentially the addition of things across all bonds such that you make the more stable carbocation. That's essentially everything we've done. And that's great. We got some good NMR love going on. Happy with that. This should Oh, oh, the, okay, no, no, it actually populated. It's just a white screen. That's what's confusing me. No, 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 something's happening. It's not good. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm going to share the screen again. It just freaked out for a moment there. There we go. So what we've covered are Markovnikov reactions. Where we could take things like this. And we add acid and water, for example. And we get that out of the reaction after you draw the mechanism. Cool. That's wonderful. What if you don't want that? What if you want to take that and you want to go to that? Well, we can't do that using the chemistry we've talked about so far because this would imply that you would have this as your intermediate. And that's insane because now you have a primary carbocation when you could have had a tertiary. That's stupid. That's never going to happen. So you can't get there from here using the chemistry we've talked about. So we need something else. So what we're going to start with today. This actually wasn't what I was intending to start with today. Fuck it. I'm going to do this today because the reason I want to talk about this is I know this is on a tutorial next week, so you're going to see it again. And um, you're going to see it where you can ask questions. So we're going to talk about the anti-Markovnikov addition of water. We'll come back to, a, I promised epoxides, we'll come back to epoxides. So, what we need to do is if we are doing something, anti-Markovnikov means the products you don't expect using a Markovnikov addition, which is the one that goes through the more stable carbocation. Let me make sure I have my chat window open. There we go. So what that tells you is we can't go through a carbocation because if we went through a carbo, I'm going to turn my video on because just gesture. Because if we go through a carbocation, then that means that, well, you're not gonna be able to get this product because you need to not go through a carbocation. So all the chemistry we've talked about isn't going to work, so we need something different. And so another way to think about this is we want to add that hydrogen to that most clustered, busy carbon. So the reagent we use for this is going to be a two-step process. Step one, we're going to use BH3. We don't see a lot of elements that aren't like the organic elements. We're reaching deep into the periodic table. Actually, we're going right next to carbon, to boron. Um, this is boron's moment to shine. And then we're going to treat that with sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. 
Now, this is going to be the first really complex mechanism we've drawn. We're going to walk through it kind of slowly. And it's going to give us the product we want when it feels like it. So, how does this work? Well, we've got a boron hydrogen and two H2s. Now, let's think about that boron hydrogen bond. Carbon hydrogen bonds are pretty much neutral. Oxygen hydrogen bonds are polarized towards oxygen. Boron is more metallic than carbon. Carbon is pretty much neutral. Boron, actually, the bond is polarized towards the hydrogen. So this kind of has a little bit of H minus character. That boron hydrogen bond is not shared equally. The hydrogen has a little bit more of the electrons. We know that this is slightly delta positive. This is slightly delta negative because if we draw a resonance structure, we're going to want to have the carbocation on the more substitute uh, carbon, hyperconjugation. So now if I look at where charges want to be with each other, these guys are kind of lining up real nice. The other thing we have going for us, so this is kind of like the electronic argument. It's going to be in red. The other thing we have going for us is a steric argument. So if we think about it, big, small, we're going to get use real technical terms here. The thing with the more carbons around it is bigger. The things with the fewer carbons around it is smaller. And by big and small, I mean the size of the electron cloud. If we go up to this guy, small, big. Hydrogen is obviously smaller than BH2 because BH2 has got something that isn't hydrogen. <laughs> Anything's bigger than hydrogen. Now, this is exactly like what we saw when we were rotating single bonds. Get the big things away from each other because they're going to bump into each other. They both have big electron clouds. You know, they're playing bumper cars. They don't want to be like that. So we want the big things away from each other. So this is lined up properly under sterics. And then we want the charges to align, and we got that too. So we've got both factors working for us here. So how do we draw some arrows here? Well, let's draw double bond attacking just as we've seen it, and it's going to attack the boron because the boron is a slightly positive side. If I do that, get the carbocation here, we're going to have the boron. Now, notice I'm not breaking a bond to boron immediately. And I can do that because boron is the second row element. It can make four bonds. It's only making three as BH3. It doesn't have any lone pairs. It's just only making three bonds. It has an empty orbital. And of course, it's going to be an empty P orbital. Because that means I can get all those electrons down to sp2 uh, orbitals. And that's why boron is planar. And it's got this empty p orbital. And the nice thing about having an empty p orbital is that sp if, if it was an empty sp3 orbital, all everything would be at sp3. And sp3 is higher energy than sp2. And stuff is lazy. And so it's going to be sp2, leaving us an empty p orbital. I love recording because if you miss that explanation, you can then go back and read it, see, listen to it again. Okay, so we have this intermediate. I'm going to put brackets around it because it tells me it's not a real thing, so I can draw it. And we have a negative charge on a boron. We have a positive charge on the carbon. And this is kind of what boron does, and we're going to see it later in this reaction. Um, boron likes being, now it's got its full octet, so it's happy. 
but it's negatively charged. So it's going to go back down to not having its full octet and being neutral. So it's kind of, it's always kind of happy. Boron is never really happy. It's never really happy with what it's got going on. And we're going to use the electrons in the boron hydrogen bond to attack the carbocation. I'm going to just move the carbocation a little bit so the arrow is a little bit clearer. That's definitely going to the bond. So I've added B, H2, and H across the double bond. And the reason we did this is because of both steric. Uh, it's pretty damn close. I think it is higher, but it's pretty damn close. I'm going to lie a little bit and just say, hey, carbon's pretty neutral. Boron and hydrogen are pretty close. But it is a combination of the sterics and the electronics here. So it's not quite all about electronegativity with this thing. It's also because boron can accept those extra electrons, so it has this empty orbital. And that makes it kind of positive. And then once it's accepted the electrons from your double bond, it's definitely uh, wanting to lose that H minus. And so that bond becomes much more polarized. So maybe it's a little bit more accurate to say that we really see that bond polarization in the intermediate, not so much in the starting material. But I'm going to simplify it, Nulia, and say, hey, we see it in the starting material. So what's important here? is that the boron and the hydrogen have to have added from the same side. And we'll see why that matters in a bit. But I'm going to add them both from the top face of this molecule. And of course, they have to add into the same side because they came in from the same side. Like boron isn't going to do a reach around here. It's going to come in definitely from the same side of this molecule. So we have this. Now, this is where it gets that and you're like, okay, well, that's not that scary. Now it gets scary. Um, there's like, this is the, um, we're getting close to Halloween. And so this is the week of the scary mechanisms. These are the scariest mechanisms in the course. There's, there's three of them. And this is one of them. Yeah. So we got hydrogen peroxide, and we got some hydroxide, and we do an acid-base reaction. Okay, that's not scary. Okay, now we're going to take advantage of boron's weirdness as a molecule. Boron's not happy being neutral with six electrons because it wants eight electrons. We have a nucleophile. There is an O minus. We have an electrophile. It is the boron's empty p orbital. We are going to attack our nucleophile into the electrophile. And that's going to give us this guy. Um, there's sodium, as I said last, there's two reagents here, boron, boron and sodium hydroxide and followed by hydrogen peroxide. OH minus exactly. Sorry. Just the O. But yeah, I'm cracking myself up. Okay. So we do this. Now something really weird happens. What we're going to do is we're going to do a shuffle. The electrons in this boron, now boron's got eight electrons, which is happy, but it's negative, so it's unhappy. So it doesn't want eight electrons. So it's trying to figure out how to get rid of eight electrons. So it wants to go back to six electrons. Well, it wants to go back to neutral. It doesn't want to go back to six electrons. And the way it's going to do that is by taking the two electrons in, and I'm actually going to change colors here, because this, this still kind of confuses me. And it's only like in the last couple of years, I don't need to look this up every time I do it.
which I know inspires confidence, is we're going to take the two electrons in that boron carbon bond and we're going to shuffle them over and they're going to attack the oxygen adjacent to it. So we're using the oxygen as an electrophile, which is just weird because it's oxygen. But there, there's, there's madness to the madness. There's like reason to the madness. And that's that that oxygen has a really, really, really weak bond attached to it. And that's his oxygen oxygen bond. There's a reason why peroxides blow up. It's because that oxygen oxygen bond is really, really weak and is quite easy to detonate. It sounds like there's a dog outside. I'm on campus and there looks to be a dog yipping. Like normally I'd say it's, some, it's an engineer, but there are no engineers on campus. So, what do we get when we do that? Okay, well, let's follow the arrows. Okay. Didn't do anything to that boron oxygen bond. That boron oxygen bond here is still intact here. It hasn't changed. But we've released hydroxide. That is completely appropriate. So, again, let's just follow the arrows. The two electrons in this bond here pivoted. They went from, I don't want to be attached to boron anymore. I'm going to be attached to oxygen instead. Okay, sure. You can, I, you mean you can do that? Um, yeah, unfortunately you can do that because imagine this is an SP2 orbital. There's an SP, there's an antibonding SP, um, SP3 orbital. There's an antibonding SP3 orbital for this oxygen oxygen thing. It's very low lying because it's a weak bond. So these electrons, instead of interacting with the boron SP3 are going to interact with an oxygen SP3. You just kind of like do a little shuffle over to the side. Like, well, I'm actually in my chair right now. So boron's above me here and oxygen's over here. I roll my chair over and suddenly I'm under oxygen instead. And I prefer to be under oxygen because it's more comfortable for me. It, I, like, of course, it looks about equally uncomfortable for me right here. Um, but the, the carbon is more comfortable with this carbon oxygen bond and the carbon boron bond. So it's favorable. That oxygen is still attached to the boron. We haven't broken that oxygen boron bond, but we've broken the oxygen oxygen bond. Nothing. There's an antibond, antibonding orbital underneath the oxygen in this right-hand structure. So we release OH minus, and note that this was an up wedge here. It's still an up wedge because I'm not doing anything to that. And this it isn't surprising right now. It's going to be surprising later. Um, I'm not doing anything to that orbital on that carbon. That carbon orbital is still the same. It's still the same sp3 orbital. It's just, it's taking its two electrons as interacting with oxygen instead of, is that a plus sign? Oh, sorry, that one. It just, it was like plus, like additional, in addition to. Yeah, um, thank you. I got confused about what we're meaning under. Carbon likes oxygen more than boron. It's a much stronger bond. Manual. Just oxygen carbon bonds are strong, oxygen boron bo uh, carbon boron bonds are weak. Very spooky. So we have this. We're not done yet because we've still got a boron attached. So we just released this OH minus. It's going to come back in and it's going to attack the boron. Because boron's got six electrons and it wants eight electrons because boron just is never happy. It's like a cat. I want in, I want out. I want to be fed. I want to be fed more. It's never, I don't want to be fed. So I guess boron's a little bit not like a cat. Um, you got the final product when you got the final product. So I think we're looking for stable molecules. Often what I'll, you're going to see only a, a set number of different reagent combinations in this class. Um, 
but often it'll be, how do I make this? This is the starting material, this is the product. Give me the reagents, give me the mechanism. So you have the product there in front of you. You kind of have the answers, like Jeopardy. Now boron's got eight electrons. It doesn't want eight electrons because it's negative. And so what it does is it can kick out the alcohol we just made. And I've spontaneously lost my dimethyl group. And it's going to be O minus at this point. But, you know, there's water around. This was hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. There's always water. So let's just scoop up an extra hydrogen from water. We need to make this neutral. We don't want any negatively charged things in our product. We're not done if it's negatively charged, generally speaking, and for the purposes of this course. We get our product. And now what we've done is we've done, yeah, of course it's on next Mobius. It could be. Um, it's not going to be. It's not going to be on this Mobius. We lost it. It fell off. It fell off right over here. Um, it, it's kind of, you know, it's hanging out. Don't care. As I said, I only care about the main carbon chain. We just, exactly. It did say peace and it pieced out. So this is hydroboration. Well, the first part here is hydroboration. Where we added hydrogen and boron. And this is all deboration, where we remove a boron. If I ask you for the mechanism, you have to show every step. If I ask you to give me the product, you do not need to show every step. God, no. There is no midterm. But even if there was a midterm, it would not be the only question. It would be one of many questions. This actually isn't a great question because this is regurgitation, right? You're going to have these notes in front of you. You can just... I would practice writing them out, understand what's going on, because I might ask questions about that. Um, but, you know, it doesn't help me a lot to ask you a question for a mechanism where you already know what the mechanism is because it's drawn out in front of you. What's important here, though, is that you get this cis. Okay. Well, that's great sort of. We're going to just take a moment and we're going to catch our breath. Because catching our breath is useful. I'll just draw a six member ring. It's a cis addition. So they're on the same side. Cis or sin, you'll see both. Because we're going to see some trans additions. So if we take HBr, we do this just as a you know an aid memoir. Make the more stable car. Nope, no, nope, bad John. Make the more stable carbocation. The R minus comes in. Yay. Yippee skippy. So it's not what I want to draw. So how do I get that? And again, what we're doing is we're trying to do the anti-Markovnikov thing there. The top one's the Markovnikov thing, the bottom one's the anti-Markovnikov. And the answer is, using the chemistry we know so far, you can't get that. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the reagents to get that. And we're going to come back to the mechanism for this at the very end of the class, of course. So how you do this one, HBr, and a reagent like, oh, I don't know. This thing, where pH equals, it's a fancy word for phenyl. When I don't want to draw a benzene ring. I'm actually, you know what? I'm going to write this out neater with arrows on top and bottom. So I'm drawing one example here. It's not clear. Any radical initiator will work. Well, no, in your specific case, that says initiator. That's not clear. Almost anything you could use would work. Um, of course, you don't know what the radical initiators are. You're not supposed to right now. I just want to say that this is a set of conditions that would be able to deliver this. We use a non-participating solvent, boring solvent, dichloromethane is great. And we either use heat or light. And that's why I've made a big fuss earlier at some point about saying you did this reaction in the dark, because if you did it in the light, you get this kind of stuff happening. You get the anti Markovnikov. Of course, this works with HCl, this works with HI, it works with any of the halogens. Doesn't work with HF. I'm not going to test you on that. You don't need to remember that. Uh, and that's because fluorine is a stupid atom. Um, it works with like ICl, you invert all the selectivity. So this is a way to basically invert the chemistry with halogens compared to what you get if you do it in the dark. If you do it in the dark, you get one product. If you do it in the light, you get the other product. That's kind of handy. I'm out of coffee. Okay, I'll survive. So, what we've just done there, um, what it does is it's, if you really want to look, if you want to look into this ahead of time because you have a burning desire to know more than anything else in the world, uh, look up radical chemistry in the textbook. I can't remember what chapter it's in. And it will, it will walk you through this. We're going to come back to this stuff. It's a different, completely different collection of mechanisms from what we're dealing with. So I don't want to bring it in now because uh, it's going to confuse. But I want to provide this as this is the complementary technology to using HBR. We can get the other product. Uh, yeah, it says also. Equals halogen. Now I want to talk about the, there, that was your break. Now we're moving on to mechanism two from hell.
I'm going to take my favorite cyclohexene for this kind of thing. I like it because it's asymmetrical, but it's really simple. Um, ooh, ooh, I talked to Dr. Eichhorn about this, and he wants me to talk about something else. So I'm going to talk about that too. So I'm going to put an isopropyl group on there and be really crazy. We can add OH and H across double bond. We can now do that both ways. But what if I want to add two OHs across the double bond? Uh, who cares? Why would you want to do that? I don't know. I don't know why you would want to do that. Maybe, maybe you do. Like there's, there's reasons. You got reasons. So what we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that is a cis dial for obvious reasons. Oh, and I've magically lost my isopropyl group. I am going to lose my isopropyl group. It is going to wander off. Um, we can also do a trans dial. And you get those using different ways. So if we're wanting, trying to add two OHs across the whole bond. Okay. Let's start with epoxides. And I want to start with epoxides because they're three-membered rings, and that plays into everything we've been talking about so far. But they come with a twist, because of course they do. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our favorite cyclohexene, and we're going to add a silly looking molecule. This guy it is called MCPVA, metachloroperbenzoic acid. It's meta. Meta means basically two, three chloro, so it's three chloro benzoic acid, but there's an extra O there, so it's per. It's a thing. Um, great reagent. They sell it like as an eighty-five percent, eighty-five percent dry solid um, with some water in it. The reason they add water is because it explodes, and so if there's no water there, it tends to blow itself up. And the thing is, is this one's sold because it's really a very stable version of it. And that's why the chloride is in the chloride doesn't matter. We're not going to care about the chloride. But if you don't have the chloride there, it blows up a lot easier. And so then companies don't want to ship them. FedEx doesn't want to. FedEx really gets nervous when they transport chemicals that blow up their trucks. So they, they like transporting this guy. As long as it's wet, it's safe. Of course, you use it, you dry it. So you got to be careful and not blow yourself up. And what we're going to make is we're going to make an epoxide. I'm just going to start with a simple version first. Um, no, no, no. I'm going to keep Dr. Eichhorn's favorite isopropyl group. What is an epoxide? An epoxide is a three-membered ring with an oxygen in it. it is an epoxide. They are found in epoxy resins. They are found in super glue. They, because they, they're reactive, that's why. It's a three-membered ring. That's bad news already. Um, we've been seeing lots of three-membered rings. These are going to react in a very, very familiar way once we get to them. But let's think about making them first, then we'll think about reacting them. Okay, so we've got this. We've got this thing. Where do I even start thinking about how to draw some arrows for this? Now, we're going to take inspiration from the hydrogen peroxide reaction we just saw in the previous thing. And we're thinking, hopefully what you're thinking is, I don't know what to do, but that oxygen oxygen bond is making me squeamish. It's making the molecule squeamish, so that's what blows up, right? So probably something to do with that. And you're right. The byproduct of this reaction is a simple carboxylic acid. So we've lost an oxygen. So how does this work? It's 
So I'm going to draw it. Like that. And I have an R there. And what does R mean? R means whatever I don't want to draw. And I can define R, and I probably should in this case. I think it's one of the first times I've drawn an R. But R is that. That takes me time to draw. I'm not going to involve it in a mechanism. It could be a smiley face. It could be a phenyl ring with a chloride on it. It doesn't matter. It's not going to participate in what I'm doing. So I don't give a shit what R is. And I'm going to just save myself some time. So we've got this guy. You know, never goes wrong to draw an arrow coming from a double bond. We've been doing that a lot. Let's do it again. And... You know, we just saw attacking oxygen, so it's it's weird, but I guess it's a thing that happens. Well, that's going to give off. That's going to make oxygen try and use five bonds because already has two lone pairs. It's got two bonds. It's going to take two more electrons. It can't do that. That would be five bonds. That's bad. You're going to need to break a bond, and we're going to need to break a bond and lose the electrons associated with that bond. H minus is not a happy molecule. O minus is pretty happy, especially because the O minus that is formed is part of a carboxylic acid. And we got great resonance and we love resonance, right? So I'm just going to draw these two arrows first. Arrow one, arrow two. And we are going to go to the product. Okay, and let, let's be let's be real traditional and old school about this. So, come back to serochemistry in a moment. I'm going to have a bond to oxygen. There's a hydrogen. I'm going to delete my R group because it is in my way. And then I'm just going to actually, I'm not going to move any of the atoms. I'm just going to draw the result. I guess I could learn how to use copy and paste and do that. And that might save me some time. But still. So, we kind of have this. Sure, I guess. We got a good resonance structure, though. So instead of redrawing this, I'm just going to show the resonance structure. It's the same thing. And now this oxygen is awfully close to that hydrogen that's on that positively charged uh, that's next to that oxygen. So if I use that lone pair, I'm going to strip that hydrogen, dump some electrons onto this oxygen. This does not exist. I'm going to put this thing in brackets to say, hey, I know it doesn't exist, but um, it's a thing that will help me make sense of reality. Because reality is scary and confusing. So if we follow that logic through, we got our carboxylic acid. Sweet. I know I get a carboxylic acid at the end here. There it is. Check. And now I got an O minus next to a C plus. And this looks really similar to all those iodines and chlorines next to C pluses. So there's one more arrow I need to draw. And hopefully you guys are already drawing it because this is an abomination unto ML Fisher, who we talked about earlier. Key of his projections, which was one mistake. And we make a three-membered ring. And everything is neutral and all the charges have disappeared. 
and you can breathe a sigh of relief for like all of 30 seconds. Okay, so what's the social purple group doing? So what I didn't show in here is the stereochemistry of these additions. But if I do this reaction, I'm going to get two products, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, I know. The CH2Cl2 is not affected by, I'm going to go back to a slide. Sorry, Bennett. Um, is CH2Cl2 the only thing that is affected by light? It's actually not the CH2Cl2 that's affected by light. It's the BRBR bond and the HBR bond. The CH2Cl2 is fine. It, it ignores the light. Yeah. Light's not a problem. Okay. So the other thing we get is we could have had the epoxy coming from the top. It was no bond, right? Flat. It's all flat. MCBA comes from the top, MCBA comes from the bottom, both possible. Same mechanism. Just depends which way you draw the wedge for that first oxygen. You get two products. Do you get an equal amount of both products? Opening question to the chat. Okay, Keith says no. Andrew says no. There are 111 people on this call. The no's are coming up. Okay, so we're getting lots of no's. Now everyone's just piling into the no wheelbarrow. Quinn says yes. Quinn's being a contrarian. Okay, does anyone who says no want to explain why they think it is no? Perfect. There we go. Per, you, you guys are freaking naturals. The isopropyl blocks the top face. Like, you, you take your crazy-ass molecule that looks like your uncle built. I'm sure you've got an uncle like this. I've got one. He lives in a farm um, north of Toronto, and he's been growing weed on his farm now for, like, I don't know, 40 years. And um, he's very happy it's legal. But he's my crazy uncle. He's a redneck, but he's like a socialist redneck. It's very weird. Anyways. It means I can talk to him now, because if he was a redneck of a different flavor, I'd find him a lot more difficult to deal with. I'm a university professor, of course. I'm a you no know, pinko socialist. So there, you got an isopropyl group. You got a cyclohexane ring on the bottom. That's big. It's not quite nice. We got dangling always. But look, if you're trying to have, if you had a double bond here, this thing's like flipping around the top here, right? That's kind of getting in a way. If you're if you're a thing, the bottom is looking a whole lot easier to approach right now, because like molecules need to get close to other molecules, and you got you got wiggles up here that's getting in your way. So you would expect that this would be major. I can't spell the word major. I also met randomly erase stuff. This is minor. And yeah, well that, yeah, I think that's my point. So this reaction, because Dr. Icorn wants to talk to you about this term in the lab, is considered stereoselective. means it has a preference. So it preferred one stereochemical outcome to the other stereochemical outcome. Because that's the relationship between these guys, right? They're stereoisomers, uh, product. You get a lot more of one than of the other if you do this chemistry. You get a bit of both, but you get more of one. And you get more of one because of that steric argument that Adriana, Janik, and Keith all mentioned. 
the key word here is selective. It is selective. So it's not, because we're going to differentiate this from specific. So mechanistically, there's no reason you can't get both. But sterically, there's a reason you're getting one over the other most of the time. You know, it might be nine to one. It might be 99 to one, it might be seven to three. I have no clue. I don't know how selective this thing is. I don't care. But you're getting one major, one minor. You don't need to tell me how by how much because um, you're not a computer. Okay, so that's how you make epoxides. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a stereospecific reaction. So I've got my epoxide I've just made. I'm going to take the major one because we're not sadists and we're not trying to fish out the minor product. I'm going to say we plan to do this all along. And if we were wrong, then we're going to say that we plan to do it all along anyways. And this is a new reaction. So this is like epoxide opening. It's not like epoxide opening. This is epoxide opening. You know what? That needs a bigger title. It's like a grand opening. 20% off everything. So if we take sodium hydroxide and water, unsurprisingly, three-membered rings are not happy. Now, does this sodium hydroxide prefer to, because we can get two different products, right? I'm very sorry. No, no, click too fast. We can attack this carbon, which would give us that or we can be crazy maybe we're not crazy we attack that carbon sorry i should have drawn the I, I missed an arrow with the blue anyways if we follow the green arrows We would get that. Which one do you think is more likely to be formed? Blue or green or left or right? Got one call for blue. Got one call for green, some greens, some blue for resonance. It's not resonance. They're exactly the same resonance. Okay, again, a bunch of the, the blue people are starting to take over. Anyone who's saying blue want to explain why they think blue is more likely? And when it says green, want to explain why they think green is more likely. The blue people seem to be very quiet. And the green negative charge interferes with the electron crowd from methyl and isopropyl. More carbons attached to blue. Which one did you argue for? You argue for blue, Mohammed? Yeah. So more carbons attached to blue is right, and that's why you're wrong. <laughs> so what we've been talking about in the previous thing with the three-membered ring thing was we had a positive charge. We had the iodonium, we had the chlor chloronium. We had this positive charge we were trying to share. So who had the bigger positive charge? The epoxide is neutral. 
So there's no real positive, there's no big positive charge on anything. That argument is still true. If there is any positive charge building up anywhere, the carbon being attacked in blue is definitely the one with the bigger partial positive charge. But that, because it's so small, because there's no positive charge on this molecule, that gets swamped by the accessibility of green. Like the hydroxide's got to navigate its way to that thingy. Um, oh good, I have my, I have my, I have a bendy, I'm, I'm okay, my molecule kick, just take one for the team. Yeah, you know what, no, it can't. It really can't take one for the team. It really doesn't want to make a three membered ring with these black ones. Um, but imagine this is bendy, this red thing here, face it with you guys, it's making like a three membered ring here. Whee! Sort of. Um, if I'm a nucleophile and I need to come in from the, the other side of this stuff, just like with the chloronium and thing, holy shit, there's like stuff in the way over here. Look at that. Look at that. Look how big there is. There's like another methyl group here. Like... And there's a mask. The mask is just attached to the methyl group. That's, that's accidental. The mask doesn't represent anything. That's just because I'm at work. So this site here, this carbon here, has got more stuff in the way. So if I'm a little hydroxyl group coming in trying to attack, it's like, oh, God, look at all the crowding in here. I need to come in from here, but there's this thing, and there's this thing, and there's all the, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Oh, this is so much more relaxing. Like there's just nothing blocking my access here on this bond angle that I need to break this thing. So we attack green because it's less crowded. So those of you who said blue, who it's Quinn and Kevin, you guys are awesome, or green. I don't. You, you can pretend that you knew it was why, and it's all good. No one will know any different, and you know I believe you. So what you have is a less crowded center there. So we prefer the attack on the green side. If it were. If it were less crowded, blue would be favorable, yes. But if it were less crowded, then blue wouldn't be the blue one because you would have removed the things next to it. So um, we're going to, we're at 224, so I won't go any further. Now, if I change the conditions and instead of sodium hydroxide and water, I'd used, you know, catalytic acid and water, then blue would be the major product. And it will be because of all the reasons why the blue side here is arguing for blue with that positive charge. Because suddenly that's not an epoxide anymore. That's going to be a protonated epoxide. You're going to have an OH plus. And now we're following, it's going to, the oxygen is going to be positive. And now we have all the same things we were thinking about with the iodine and the chlorine happening. So the reason is there's no positive charge here. That's why we're favoring the green. But as soon as we introduce a positive charge onto that oxygen, we're going to favor the blue. And we're going to pick up with that next class. So I'll see you in 48 hours. Okay. God, that doesn't seem very long. Okay. To have a really good couple of days. Good luck on the lab. Good luck on the assignment. Um, enjoy. Okay, maybe I'll see you then. Three Amory said maybe. That's fine. I'm not hurt. Have a really good rest of your day.